verses 13 through 18. For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my, so and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day of worship that you've blessed us with. Thank thee for all the many blessings of life that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for your son who willfully went to that cruel cross to die for our sins. Pray that you'll be with us as we go to our classes this morning. Pray that you'll bless the efforts that our teachers have put into the lessons that they're about to present. Pray that you'll bless the students with open hearts and minds. Pray that you'll be with us through our worship today. May we pray that everything that is said and done will be in accordance with your will. Pray that you'll forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. What a beautiful Lord's Day we have to join together. The weather is beautiful outside. We're thankful for opportunity to gather here in our comfortable building and have the opportunity now to engage in a study of God's Word. We're especially grateful for any guests who are here among us today. We invite you back to be here with us anytime you can. We'll dismiss now with the nursery preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. Middle school, high school, and adult classes are dismissed.
and it was written by Aubrey Johnson. If you want a good study on encouragement, I would suggest that you check this book out of the uh, library. It's helped me, and I think it's helped everyone in the class um, who was studying this. But anyway, at the conclusion of one of his lessons, uh, he asked, was there anybody in the class that would be willing to teach um, the following Sunday? As you could probably understand that you probably heard a pin drop and there's two things that man fears the most and one is death and the other is speaking in public and I had what you call a near-death experience so I grabbed my book trying to look inconspicuous and Johnny said Robert's thinking about it Then another said Robert uh, we want you to teach this class and I won't mention who but somebody else said Robert, we're encouraging you to teach this class. So I thought I'd uh, go home and give Johnny the common courtesy of looking at the chapter and seeing if it was something that I thought that I could do. So I turned to page 131. I'll remember this page for the rest of my life. And the title to this chapter was Courage to Believe. I kind of shook my head and and that was a problem that I was having. And then I read the quote, and it said, Life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. And then I told myself that this is probably something that I needed to do more for myself than for the class. Because we all run into this time that we have fears will debilitate us, and it could actually stop us. But before I read the content of the chapter, my mind actually went back to a ceremony that was taking place in, the, uh, in the Washington at the White House. President Barack Obama was awarding a Congressional Medal of Honor, and I'd like to share that with you at this time because I think it applies to our lesson. At 6 a.m. on October the 3rd of 2009, it said that combat Outpost Keaton in Afghanistan came under a complex attack from enemy forces of over 400. The fighters, they said, occupied the high ground on all four sides and initiated the attack with concentrated fire with rifles, rocket propelled grenades known as RPGs, heavy machine guns, mortars, and small arms fire. The gentleman that I'm fixing to tell you uh, exhibited uncommon valor in the face of danger. His name is Staff Sergeant Clinton L. Romisha. He displayed extraordinary heroism through a day-long engagement in which he killed multiple enemy fighters. He recovered the fallen, even though they were being dragged away by enemy forces. He uh, did multiple recovery and resupply and counterattacks. Staff Sergeant Ramesha had the courage to believe in himself and his men under difficult circumstances. Even after the generator that he was using was hit by an RPG and he was injured with shrapnel, he still exposed himself to enemy fire to fend off the enemy advancement. On that day of his life, life did shrink or expand in proportion to this man's courage. We, not, we may not face an enemy that has machine guns or RPGs or mortars in our lifetime, but we do face the enemy that will try to destroy you and me through fear. We must be willing to put our safe in the face of fear. Fear is a debilitating disease that Satan uses to defeat God's children on our individual battlefronts. The war of self-doubt and lack of confidence can restrain and actually stop yours and my growth. I wanted to have a good understanding of what the word courage was, so I went to the dictionary and it reads, to meet danger without fear or bravery. I don't necessarily know as that's true. I redefined it as courage is not the absence of fear, but the ability to face our fears. And you and I will end up in that situation throughout our lifetime as being a Christian. I broke our study down into two categories this morning. The courage to believe in oneself and the courage to believe in others, even though we may know their sins and their faults. 
The courage to believe in self is a battle you and I will face at times, and I want to look at an Old Testament character this morning that faced the battle in his own life. He was born in Egypt when God was fulfilling his promise to Abraham in Genesis 18 and verse 18 that he would make of him a mighty nation. The Egyptians began to be fearful of the children of Israel because they grew mighty in number. So Pharaoh decreed that if it be a son, thou shalt kill him. If it be a daughter, then she shall live. But we know in the story that the midwives feared God and they did not do this evil. A male child was born to a Hebrew woman. She hid the child for several months until she could not hide the child any longer. She formed an ark, floated the child down the river in which Pharaoh's daughter saw the child. She loved the child and raised the child as her own, and his name was Moses. We read in Exodus chapter 2 that Pharaoh saw that child, and she did love him. We know that Moses lived in Egypt for approximately 40 years. He was reared in the house of Pharaoh and lived there until he saw an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, and he slew that Egyptian. The Bible says that Pharaoh sought his life, so Moses fled to the plains of Midian, where he lived additional 40 years, married, and worked as a shepherd. At the age of 80 years old, God spoke to Moses from a burning bush that did not burn. I call Moses Israel's and my reluctant hero because a lot of things that he experienced during this time, you and I probably would have too. Most of not all of us would have the same responses to God as he did. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and if someone would read verses 7 through 10. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. I don't know about you, but if I was Moses, I would have probably been real excited that the Egyptians were fixing to get their just reward. God was going to fight their battles until the point they said, Moses, you're the man for the job. Several things that I thought of that Moses might have been fearful of. He had killed a man. Probably he had some self-preservation concern, but who was Moses talking to? He was talking to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that had pressed, promised Abraham that he would make thee a great nation. He promised in thy seed all nations would be blessed. He promised Abraham that he would give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And one of these promises was going to occur and be fulfilled by what Moses would do by the hand of the Almighty Jehovah. The second thing was, Moses said, who am I? A lot of times in our life we ask that question, who am I to teach this class or go there and do this or go there and do that? But it's something that we need to have the confidence that no matter what we face in this life, God is with us. He had a self-confidence problem. He didn't have the courage to believe in himself. If someone had carried the reading on to Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 and 12.
And God said to Moses that I shall bring the children out of Egypt. And he said, certainly I will be with thee. Fear of the unknown is a devastating disease, again, that Satan uses to discourage, limit, and at times stop what God would have us to do. Save your place in Exodus chapter 3 and turn over to Hebrews chapter 13, and I'll read a couple verses there. Hebrews chapter 13, we'll begin our reading in verse 5. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We need to have the confidence to believe to believe that when we're doing the will of the Father that he is our helper, not only in our greatest time of need, but every time of need. Was not God with Noah when he prepared the ark to the saving of his house, with the children of Israel when the walls of Jericho fell, when young David stood before the Goliath and slew him with a stone? And he will be with us as we walk through our paths of lives too. And God was encouraging Moses that he would be with him also when he returned to Egypt. Again, we may not face a a giant as David did or a Pharaoh as Moses did. We will face situations that we can know that the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. There's a passage in the Bible that most of you could probably quote, and it expresses God's care for his people. It's Psalms chapter 23. It reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Certainly that is a beautiful passage. And something that we can take comfort in is that God cares for his people. And God was encouraging Moses on Mount Horeb that he would not have to walk this path alone. Another concern Moses expressed, if they ask, who sent me, what shall I say? Back in Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, it reads, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial for all generations. The great I am, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he's our God that said that he will never leave us nor forsake us. I am said that I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty, the God that said in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. His words, his power, and his promises are as powerful in the beginning as they are now, and as they were with Moses when he said, I will be with thee. We can take comfort in knowing that God of all things still has a plan for his people, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Moses also had a third and fourth concern. 
Moses' third concern was, what if they don't believe? Well, God provided the answer to that too, signs and wonders. Moses also said, I'm not eloquent in speech. God answered that with a question. If somebody would read Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 10, and read through 12, please. Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 10, and read through 12. We know that Moses did go back to the land of Egypt. Of course, he was facing some fears and difficulties in his own life. But God walked with him. Ten plagues was brought on the land and on the people. Israelites were allowed to go, but they were confronted with one of the great obstacles of faith that they experienced in their life. It was called the Red Sea. The Egyptians were on one side, The Red Sea was on another. They began to complain, what do we do? In Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 13, I do believe is one of the strongest passages that God is with his people, that Moses states before the children of Israel. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show, show to you today. For the Egyptians who you have seen, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. You know, when we stop to think who's fighting our battles, what do we have to fear? Our insecurities and other things that come into play, whether it's speaking to an individual about the souls, about their personal soul, or teaching a class, or carrying on a work in the church, our insecurities can stop us. But if we tend to, um, tend to do things that are outside our comfort zone, it will help us grow. We have also been given a mission that I alluded to earlier. In Matthew 28, beginning in verse 19, it says, "'Go ye therefore and teach all nations.'" baptizing them into the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded, and lo, I'm with you always until the end of the world. Amen. In part two of our study, we need to have the courage to believe in others even though we may know their sins and their faults. Sometimes if we know a person's history, whether it be friend or foe, it can keep us from doing what God has commanded you and I to do. We may ask the same question as Moses did. Who am I to this person? Or we may say, isn't that the preacher's job? We pay Chad to do that. What about our elders, our deacons? But that's not the case. The commission has been to all of us to go and teach and baptize and teach some more. But if you ever thought when our insecurities rear their head that we may be limiting the power of God's gospel by not spreading his truth to an individual that may have a receptive heart. For there's one thing that you and I can't know is what is in the mind of man. Just as Mordecai told Esther, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I do believe in God's providence that he places man and women in certain places in our lives just as he did in Moses' and Esther's case. For we know that the gospel, for the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, unto the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, 
as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Several months ago, we had a preacher come to the congregation here in a meeting, and he told us about a particular conversion of an individual that was in jail. And I want to share that for those that maybe wasn't here to hear this. This was written from the Christian Chronicle by Bobby Ross, Jr. And it reads, Nearly 16 years ago, one of America's most notorious serial killers was attacked and killed while cleaning a prison bathroom. Few mourn this gruesome end of Jeffrey Dahmer, who strangled and dismembered over 17 boys and men and even cannibalized some of them. The writer wrote, Did Jeffrey Dahmer go to hell? Or was there a chance to see Brother Jeffrey in heaven? How you answer this may depend on whether you believe God can work miracles in the minds and hearts of men, even behind bars. When, Defrey, when, De, when Dahmer died, I was a staff writer, the writer wrote, in Oklahoma. I will never forget talking that day with Kurt Booth, a member of the Crescent Church of Christ in Oklahoma, about his role in Dahmer's conversion. I know Jeffrey was really ready, Booth told me. Today all the angels in heaven are rejoicing because Jeffrey has come home. When I read this article first, I, I wept because the power of the gospel is held in our hands. But sometimes, I know in my case, and maybe in your case, we withhold that gospel out of fear of the individual. In Booth's case, it was Jeffrey Dahmer. In our case, it may be a family member that we don't want to offend. But if we believe that God gave his son and he purchased a church and the Lord adds to the church daily such as should be saved, we need to get out of our comfort zone. Souls are at risk. People are marching one by one into something that they do not expect. There's a lot of people in our communities that think that they're right with God, and they're not. Because if there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. There's one. And if the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, we need to believe that and we need to share that gospel. The reaction that man may have is not the one that we typically want. We want the receptive heart, but it doesn't relieve us of our responsibility because the Bible says if there's any other gospel that preached than that which you've received, let them be accursed. And the Bible says that you can know the truth. You can know the truth. So there is a truth for man to obey. And once we know that truth, and that truth is expressed to the world, it does what? What does the Bible say that it does? It frees mankind. Jesus died for the church. He purchased that church with his own precious blood that day, which he's allowed us to be members of. And the least that we can do is tell man about God's church. Going on with the story. Booth said he had no doubt about the sincerity of Dahmer's conversion. On the great resurrection day, I'm expecting to see him right along there with Abraham, David, Isaac, James, John, and all the saints that have lived right up to the modern day. That's exciting to know that God forgives sins. There's not one of us that hasn't faced sin in our life. But we have to express that sin can be forgiven. But if the saved are in the church, God would not leave it up to man's own devices to determine what is in the church. If there's one body, and in the beginning of Ephesians, the Bible says it's the church, and Jesus said it's the kingdom, there can't be multiple teachings. 
I talked to an individual, um, several individuals in the past two weeks about this subject. And I asked them this question. If everyone is teaching something different on every corner of every street, which truth are you going to obey? For we know that the Bible says, Thy word is truth, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. God's word is all sufficient, and, he's been, and, he, and he has given it to you and to I to share. Be going back to our uh, article here, Booth usually ministered to inmates in prison closer to home. But in April 1944, he caught a glimpse of Dahmer on television. Dahmer mentioned he, would wished, he wished he could find a little peace. And I like what Booth said. The Oklahoma church member sensed what he considered the hurt of Dahmer's voice and his eyes. Booth said he thought, I know someone that can give you peace. And that's Jesus Christ. He's the Savior of the world. But so many people are unprepared for this journey. Every day we open the papers and we look at the obituaries and this person or that person has died. And how ready were they to face their eternal reward and judgment? Reward can be looked at two different ways. In the Bible it says, Behold the goodness and the severity of God. God is a loving God or he would not have sent his son. But God also holds us to a standard which is in his word. And it says, Go ye therefore and teach. It doesn't say, Go ye therefore chat and teach, which he does a wonderful job. But that's why we need to obtain knowledge so that we can be ready to give an answer for anyone that asks. Booth said Dahmer, uh, sent Dahmer a Bible correspondence course talking, uh, teaching the steps of salvation. Dahmer mailed the answers back and thanked Booth for the course. But he said, I still have a problem, Dahmer wrote. The prison... Uh, the prison does not have a baptismal tank, and Mr. Burkham, the prison chaplain, is not sure if he can find someone to bring a tank in and baptize me. I've taken all the steps for th but this. Man needs to know that there is a plan of salvation. Jesus said, whoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It's not something that Robert says or you said, but it's something that God has instructed man to do. And God has told us in his word, what's it for? Once man believes and be baptized, it said, the Lord adds to the church daily such as should be saved. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The Bible says that Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, why, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Dahmer knew by what he had studied he was not in fellowship with God as of yet. Carrying on. Booth contacted Roy Ratcliffe, a minister at the Madison Church of Christ in Wisconsin. Ratcliffe set up weekly Bible lessons with Dahmer and baptized him on May the 10th of 1940, 1994. Could you imagine his excitement? Knowing and trusting in God's word that his sins are forgiven. And if anybody had a lot of sins, Jeffrey Dahmer did. Jeffrey Dahmer responded to the preacher in this way. He didn't look forward to the minister's visit. Dahmer knew what he had done. Sometimes our conscience plagues us. He dreaded that the preacher might say, no, you're too evil. You're too sinful. I can't baptize someone like you, Redcliffe said. Do you think Paul had that same thought? 
for he stood and watched Stoneman, uh, Stephen being stoned. Sometimes we find ourselves in that situation. Of course, a lot of times, we'll never be, live the perfect life as Jesus did. I'm not saying that. Because we'll struggle with insecurities. We'll struggle with sin and weaknesses. But thanks be to God, we have a forgiving God that gave his son on the cross of Calvary that we may have life and that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper and what shall I fear from man? Booth said he contacted other preachers besides Radcliffe, but they were kind of scared to go into him. I don't know if I'd have been one of those persons because I know Jeffrey Dahmer's history. It's frightening. It's frightening what man can do to man sometimes. But again, we cannot read into mind, man's mind and see if their heart's receptive. What God has commanded you and I to do is to know, teach, and baptize. Water and plant. And what does the Bible say? And God will give the increase. Booth said he contacted other preachers. They were also scared to go in. Booth himself served more than four years in a Kansas prison for what he called thievery. Behind bars, he studied the Bible. However, he did not obey the gospel until years later, watering and planting. After prison, he drank, he abused drugs, and he ended up in a ditch after a drunken night of hunting raccoons. When a doctor told him in 1987 that his life was almost over, he remembered all the promises he made to God in prison and began to contemplate his own eternal salvation. Booth called his nephew, a preacher named Phil Sanders, and asked what to do. Now listen, Booth, his wife Jenny, and three others studied with Sanders all five were baptized in a pond behind the house. God's word is powerful, and they had a receptive heart. An amazing change took place in Kurt Sanders, a speaker for In Search of the Lord Way television ministry in Oklahoma, Oklahoma, wrote in a tribute to his uncle's death in 2005. Now listen. After his baptism, Booth led more than 1,000 inmates, 1,000 souls to Christ. Quite a tribute. It's quite exciting. And one of those was Brother Jeffrey Dahmer. It's exciting to know that God does forgive our sins. Sin is sin. From a lie to a murderer, God looks is sin. Sin is a violation of the law. God's truth is to be carried to all men and we should not let our fears of the unknown overshadow God's will for man. And what's God's will for man? To come into the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that we can teach man so that we can educate about the one church, the one body that he died for, his precious church that he gave with his own blood. There's a passage that I want to share that I think everybody in here can relate to. It's an Old Testament passage, and I'll share it with you in just a second. For the gospel is the power of God that saved you and saved I, as well as Brother Jeffrey Dahmer. We should never discount God's power by withholding the truth from the world. Even though we may know their sins, God has said when a person obeys the truth, and this is the passage, I really want you to think about this. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow, Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. 
And as God looked down on Jeffrey Dahmer, when he believed and obeyed that form of doctrine that has been delivered, he added him to the one church, the one body, that teaches the one faith, that teaches the one baptism, as he has to you and to I. We've got about a minute left in our lesson here, and um, that concluded my lesson. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. And look at what Paul did. Goodness. Look what Booth did. And you and I have the same possibilities in our life to teach that truth. May God bless our reading today, and I hope in some way this has helped you. You're dismissed.